Okay, thank you. Well, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read to you the preamble, which I assume you can find in the, uh, in the program. Uh, and I won't read the bios because they're also provided, but I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Bill Wesley, the Executive Director for Plans and Policy, U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, Dr. Shun Murray, Associate Professor of, <clears throat> excuse, for, excuse me, from the School of International Service, American University. And also uh, Ms. Nina Serafino, the Specialist in, to International Security Affairs and Congressional Research Service. So um, uh, using scientific methodology, we're going to have Mr. Wesley go first because he's the only one that has slides and I actually got the projector to work. So uh, with no more delay, we'll have you start, sir. Okay. Th uh, thanks, Tony. And then uh, for Derek, thanks for letting me be here. And obviously, my uh, great thanks to Admiral Howe. Uh, on behalf of Admiral Harris, it's my pleasure to be here today to represent the Pacific Fleet. I used to tell folks when I'd give briefings that I'm glad to be in the D.C. arena because no one has a clue what happens beyond the West Coast. And I said, I'm glad to be here to let you know what's happening in Westpac. So sometimes that was received very well. Sometimes it wasn't received very well. Uh, what you're seeing here is this slide. Uh, what I'm going to concentrate on is some operational things. And then what Tony asked me to do is look at assessments. And he says, how are you doing uh, the things that you are doing, the operations, actions, activities, et cetera, and then are you assessing them? And are you doing the right things? A lot of times that's a question we ask every day at PAC Fleet. So as a consequence, this one here represents the high end of ROMO, the range of military operations. It's a valiant shield exercise, three carrier battle groups, all the services, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps. That's the high end. And if you can do the high end of operations, you can always do HADR, which we talked about the other day. If you have a Navy or a Naval force built for HADR, you cannot do this. And that's something that Admiral Harris represents to everybody all the time. So this is our AOR. We talked about it the other day. Uh, you can see these things. Uh, I provided the slides to Tony. If you want them, you can ask Tony. He'll be able to give them to you, I'm sure. Shows where we are. Uh, third Fleet, Seventh Fleet, International Dateline, half the world's surface, six of the largest uh, militaries. And we got lots of flashpoints we have to be concerned about. Admiral Harris has put in place the most uh, qualified folks in all the various command billets that have a lot of Westpac experience. Uh, we think that's absolutely critical. If you look at this thing, when people talk about the rebalance, Admiral Harris always wants everybody to know that the rebalance is real and we're doing it in the Westpac arena and the Asia Pacific or the Indo Pacific, depending upon what terminology you want to use. He likes to emphasize that he's been on PA to Poseidon, he's a P3 guy by trade. Uh, we've got the uh, Joint Fighter coming, we've got the best CVMs. We're going to transit, uh, 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 transition from uh, George Washington to the Ronald Reagan. What's good about that is Bob Gurrier, who's our deputy, he was the uh, battle group commander when we did Operation Tomodachi in Japan. So the Reagan coming to Japan will again enhance and advance our relationship with the Japanese. Uh, you've got the uh, MV-22. The reason I like to show that one is because the JGSDF, the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force, is buying them. They're going to use them as a quick reaction force. Guess where they're going to be located? Lower Ryukus. What's near there? The Senkakus. So as a consequence, that's something we're looking at. And then obviously the submarines and the DGG-1000. These are things we're really pleased we're going to get. As you look at this thing, there's lots of flashpoints here. And this is the thing we look at just about every single day. Uh, up in the uh, up northern part there, you get the Kuros, Russia, Japan. They haven't settled that since World War II. You've got the Takdo or Takashima, which is the uh, Korean and Japanese way of saying it. The United States takes the position of Lee and Court Rocks. Uh, the Koreans are so forceful that they uh, named a ship Takdo just to basically punch everybody in the eye. The Japanese are much more subdued. They had uh, their Ozumi, and that one is uh, basically the old prefecture uh, where it was located uh, for uh, Takashima uh, years and years ago. So they did it subtly. J uh, Korea did it uh, basically in your face. Then you've got the East Sea, the China Sea. You've got the Senkakus. The Spratleys are the uh, pinkish colored areas there. And then you got the Nine Dash Line, uh, which uh, basically was originally in 1947 by uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, we don't give it any credence. Uh, a lot of people look at it and they say, uh, OK. Uh, the J Chinese are very adamant uh, when you look at five countries claiming areas in there that they're going to control it. Uh, this next slide is really important uh, because it shows the reclamation <coughs> effort in the South China Sea. This is gone going. Uh, we think they're going to build a couple runways down that area. Uh, they're going to have an area that they're going to put a fleet probably in Hainan, and then they're going to have the force projection capabilities to be there. I had a meeting with uh, Daz, the uh, uh, Sea Wright, uh, two weeks ago. She wanted to know what red lines we could put in it from a military perspective. I'll keep this all at the young class level. And, and I, what I told her was basically, you don't want military red lines there. What you want are the diplomatic, political, and economic solutions you guys have to push forward from the DC arena because you don't want us doing it because it might go kinetic. And as a consequence, it was a very interesting conversation. And then this is what we say to a lot of audiences. Is China going to rise peacefully? Or are they going to rise in a coercively? 
you can take your pick. My personal opinion is that uh, we don't know which way they're going to go. And right now, they don't back away. Uh, I have a, a very good friend, uh, our New Zealand uh, uh, Consul General, uh, a new posting there in Hawaii. He says, you've got to draw up to the line. He says, and the Chinese will always lean over it. And if you uh, back off at all, then they'll take the big step forward. So we're, we're watching them carefully. And I've only been handling the Chinese-Taiwan problem since 1995. Uh, for me, it's one of those things we look at constantly. And then you can see the quote by Xi Jinping. You've got to take that at heart and see what's going to happen next. Uh, on our strategy, uh, the low ends, uh, obviously, what uh, Joe Nye talked about with soft power, that's the HADR aspects of it. We do a lot of it in our theater, uh, real world and also exercise wise. Uh, you look at the annual X, a bilateral event, high end with the Japanese. It's great exercise. Malabar is wonderful. Uh, it's a bilateral normally between us and the Indian Navy. We've had as many as five countries participate in it. Uh, we're going to have uh, Japan in the next one. It'll be in October, November time frame. That's another high-end event. And then we talked about RIMPAC. But the key thing on this one are the six imperatives that Admiral Harris has. Uh, be ready to fight tonight, posture forward, demonstrate commitment, foster cooperation, assure the region, and innovate to survive or harnessing innovation. These are really key to him. And I have to give assessments on about four of those because they're in my area. On this thing here, we talked about Damian yesterday. Again, this kind of shows the scene, what goes on there, how we uh, use all the assets available. I get asked all the time, how come the Mercy didn't come there? You got to be invited in to do HADR events. The Mercy was not needed. The, Jap uh, the uh, Philippine government did not ask for it. That's why the Mercy did not deploy. At that time, uh, the Chinese, they sent uh, their Peace Arc there, uh, the, the ship, and I can't remember the Chinese name for it, but it was stationed about 20 miles out, and they only saw seven or eight patients. Not a big deal as far as we were concerned, but it was good that they came there. And I think the idea behind HADR is that everybody wants to come and provide help to those that are suffering. Uh, Pacific Partnership 214 was a challenge for us. The reason I bring this up, this is really an HADR focused event, uh, medical diplomacy, engineering, a lot of things we do, working with uh, non-government organizations. Uh, it worked out really well for us because the Japanese came to our defense. We had sequestration in effect. We lost the money for uh, the Mercy, which was supposed to be out in 2014. So we're trying to figure out how we can do it. And we had a, a good conversation with uh, the JMSDF side, and they volunteered to have the Kunasaki support us. Uh, I'll give you one side story to this thing. Uh, <laughs> Vietnam didn't want the Kunasaki to come into Vietnam to do a Pacific Partnership, but they want a Pacific Partnership. We gave them a deadline of 16.30 on a certain day, and at 16.29, they finally said the Kunasaki can come in and we could do Pacific Partnership. Uh, for 2015, uh, someone talked about it the other day, I think it was uh, Admiral uh, Colin Chen, uh, Vietnam has adamantly said no, so we're not going to have uh, the Japanese ship go in there this year. We got an AOE that's going to be with us, uh, helping us out. Uh, so they've refused it this year, just to let you know how things get to be a little bit dicey there. But this has been a program now for uh, 10 years. It's worked out really great for us. And it, uh, we're going to send the Mercy to Southeast Asia and Oceania. We're also going to have the JHSV, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, Carrot, uh, this is a bilateral event that's over 20 years old with six countries. It's grown to 10 countries now. Admiral Harris has got a focus now. He wants to make a trilateral or multilateral. We're going to do that in 2016. Charlie Williams, who's the Commonwealth Westpac commander, he's got a great job of coordinating this. And these are the kind of things that we do. And this advances that relationship again within the theater, which is good for us. RIMPAC, we talked about that a little bit yesterday. Uh, this kind of shows what's going on. Already, Turkey said they want to come. Uh, they had observers. Now they're going to participate. Uh, to show you how important it is to some of the smaller countries, Bangladesh sent observers to 2014. You have to have observers there before you can bring a ship. Uh, they've gone over excess defense article cutters that are in Bangladesh right now, the Sudahara Joy, as they've named it. Sudahara Joy is going to go from Bangladesh to uh, RIMPAC in 2016. People keep asking me about China. Are they going to participate in 2016? We and Admiral Harris have recommended that they participate. Uh, OSD is still determining whether or not they want to extend the invitation. Uh, well, that's one of the things we have to work through. If they come, great, and if they don't, we'll work around it. Uh, when you look at the SIFMIC course, we do this co-hosting with the Naval War College. I can't give enough uh, credit to uh, Jamie Kelly, uh, Sleep Spindley, and uh, Sean Carroll for the great work they do helping us out. Uh, we've been doing this for almost uh, 10 years now, and this is one of the really great courses. This past year, we had 14 foreign flag officers come, including Sri Lanka, which was a big step up to get them back into the class again. Uh, has a HADR uh, and a, a little bit of a security focus. We also have two uh, foreign senior uh, facilitators that help us out. Arun Prakash, uh, Admiral Prakash is a former CNO and Chief of Defense for India, very close friend of mine. This was his fourth year of helping us out. And then uh, Yoji Kota, Vice Admiral Kota, uh, is uh, 
great to give his perspectives on what he views uh, China's doing in the theater in Northeast Asia. So it's a great uh, environment, uh, lots of uh, cross-fertilization of ideas, and these are lasting relationships. And right now, if I remember correctly, we have three SIFMEC grads that are now chiefs of their Navy in the theater. Uh, I bring this one up here just to talk about medical uh, diplomacy. Uh, the reason I bring up medical diplomacy, that's the thing that opens up doors. Uh, if you want to really get into a country such as Vietnam and ex uh, expand an advanced relationship, it's through the uh, medical side of it, uh, undersea medicine, uh, the other things that we do with them, medical SMEs, et cetera. That's extraordinarily important, and that's why we're getting an awful lot of bang for our buck, if you will, in the engagement phase. So now I come to this slide, and this uh, slide shows you when people ask me, well, how do you figure out your maritime security cooperation plan? There's lots of things that influence it, dealing with policy, uh, direction, government. Uh, you can see some of the documents here that we use. It's important for us. Uh, we have the theater campaign plan that PACOM has that we developed the theater campaign order to support them. And then we have the Maritime, Maritime Security Cooperation Plan, which we've been promulgating for over, I think, 10 or 12 years now. I've been the five there for 14 years, and it took me a couple of years to figure out we really needed this. So this complements what uh, we get out of the higher agency directions, guidance, et cetera. Uh, then you look at this one. Reason I'm going to dwell on this one just for a, a couple of uh, minutes here is that uh, this is how we grade folks in the, the PACOM uh, Pacific Fleet uh, operating area. One through five. One's the best we can ever do. We want to have those guys achieve that. There's a very few countries we want at the one level. The number five level are those that we not engage. DPRK is one of them. We don't want China to get too, above, too much above five, to be honest with you. That, that's a, a personal opinion and one thing we look at because of policy, the NA2000, some of the things that we can do. A lot of congressional oversight, as we all know. So we're looking at that one carefully. But we look at these various fins and uh, we try to look at those uh, very carefully over the course of the year and we assess them every year. Are they still the right bins? Are they still the right criteria? We look at a lot of things that go into this thing. Uh, a lot of reports. Uh, we have a, that's known as a MAG, a Maritime Assessment Group. It's led by uh, my uh, deputy and my uh, Maritime Domain Awareness uh, Director. Uh, we have the POLAD, uh, our political advisor. He starts out the conversation. Here's the political situation in this particular country. And then we have uh, the uh, uh, IPO representatives, we have the Seventh Fleet, Third Fleet, we have the uh, folks from PACOM, we have other services. We all go through this. We look at the Intercooperation Management Information System reports. So there's an awful lot that goes into this. We assess it and we have today, because the Navy's done a great job with this FAO program, the Foreign Area Officer Program, our desk officers are now FAOs. When I got there 14 plus years ago, I only had one, one FAO kind of guy, and that was it. And I didn't have anybody that spoke a different language. Today, you got five different languages being spoken. I got five that speak Mandarin. So we really moved up, and they've got a lot of regional expertise. So this is how we look at it, and there's 36 countries in the PACOM AOR. We grade 34 countries. We cut out four of them. Four of them that we cut out are Mongolia, Laos, uh, Bhutan, and Nepal, because they're landlocked. We really don't engage in that much. So you say, how do you get to 34? Well, we add in Taiwan, because we have a separate engagement with Taiwan, and then we add in Russia. Russia belongs in the UCOM AOR, but because we have the Far East Military District there, we do a number of uh, exercises with them, and we engage them, and we have visits with them. We have them involved as well. So that's why we assess 34 countries, and I can't show you the slide that shows how we assess them, because that's secret, no foreign. So what I did is I just want to show you this slide, but then I wanted to go through the criteria of things that measures the performance. This is how we look at all these countries. And we want to see if we're on track or off track with our operations, our activities, and the <coughs> actions that we take. We do these things uh, routinely. Every week we have a meeting on this stuff with various countries as we go through it. And we want to make sure that we're not forgetting something or there may be an added emphasis uh, to engage someone because maybe the commander has something he wants to achieve or maybe the PACOM direction is there or we've gotten a CNO to say, uh, hey, uh, have you looked at this? Uh, right now, we've got a request to support Colombia to be part of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, which are 26 countries, basically. And we're the voting member at PAC Fleet, and uh, the working group meeting is next month. My deputy's going to go there. Uh, we're going to basically put Colombia on the table as a, a member. We're also going to proselytize cues, the code for unplanned encounters at sea, uh, to make sure that Coast Guards use it, not just navies. That's something very important for us because that shows intent. And that way you'll avoid the unintended consequences and things that happen within particularly the South China Sea, East China Sea areas. But this kind of shows how we look at it, the things we look at, and why we look at them. And then you look at the effects. You know, are you doing uh, a lot of things, but are you doing the right things, and are you getting the effects you want? 
Now, I had a, a conversation with Mark Lippert, who's now the ambassador to Korea, uh, a few years ago when he was on the, in the, in, at defense. And my view is sometimes they'll take five years, 10 years, or longer to have an effect. A lot of people want the instant return on investment. I get asked that question all the time, and it's a difficult one to ask. We think we're doing the right things. Sometimes you don't know if you got the return on investment right away that you make an assessment. There are some that say you can. Now, I say it's really difficult to do. Uh, Tony knows it from his days at Seventh Fleet that this is probably one of the hardest things you can do. But these are some of the things we look at as you look at that uh, maritime assessment group of what they have to do. Then you go scoring. How do you score within a bin? And then you got to figure out, are we doing all these right things? Uh, what's the subjectiveness, if you will? Uh, a lot of it is very difficult to do, and that's where it comes with the experience and the expertise and how you look at it. And once my uh, team gets all done and they come to me and they, they look at this, well, we're going to rate this one three, this one two, this one a four, and we sit down with me. I've only got 40 years in the Pacific uh, AOR, and uh, I lived overseas for 20 years, and I'll look at them and I'll go, are you kidding me? And then, uh, and then they'll convince me. And so once they convince me, I'm a happy camper. Uh, but these are the things we do, and, and these are the types of things they look at, and this is how we score it. And then uh, once we've done that, then we move on to this type of chart. Okay, what we want to do, these guys we think could be a two, these guys would be this, whatever. Uh, we want to have move up. The blue is what we want to have is aspirational. That's what we want them to be. But where are they now? Well, they're in the red block. Well, if they're in the red block, how can we move them out? What's it going to take? These are the things that we look at on a routine basis as we do these assessments. And it takes a lot of work, as many of you can imagine. Uh, and once we've done that and said, well, okay, I guess we're going to have to improve this area here. We've got to spend more time on coalition building. Well, some don't have the capacity or capability to do it, and they'll never get there. But that's where it's important to work with IPO and Admiral Shannon and his folks to make sure we understand what's going on to support their type of strategic program as well. Uh, and also, when you start looking at how you work within the theater, uh, we've been trying uh, through Admiral Harris and our CIFMA courses last time to try to come up with a multilateral standing force. We tried this 12 years ago. We called it uh, uh, SEAM, Southeast Asian Maritime Security Initiative. Then it became uh, the Regional Maritime Security Initiative. Today it's called Maritime Security. Uh, so we had a thing called CERC, Southeast Asia Regional Coalition Headquarters. Well, now they're thinking maybe Singapore, as you heard a talk the other day, might be a place to have a standing force. And in uh, open press reporting recently, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, Burma, Vietnam, and uh, maybe the Philippines might get together to start looking at uh, maritime security and some of the issues we're having with sea robbery, sea banditry. I never want to use the word piracy too much in our theater because most countries don't like the word piracy. They think it's all sea robbery or sea banditry. So you have to be very careful on terminology. But those are things we look at, so that's how you could develop a coalition force. And they're thinking of doing that, which is a step up. And we try to advertise that, and we're going to bring it up at the next uh, ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting Experts Working Group, because I have reps that go to that. And uh, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to have some influence there. And we're going to discuss this further with them to see if we can get some traction on it. So reason we did that, that's the assessments. And since we have a short time, I just want to also talk about when you look at the new things coming into our theater, one of the things Admiral Harris says is we've got to innovate, we've got to start moving at things, looking at tactics, techniques, procedures. So we got the uh, LCS. Everybody doesn't say a lot of good things about it, but we in the Pacific Theater enjoy the LCS. It's doing a great job. We're going to use it uh, in a number of uh, areas that are really important for us. We've got proof of concept for it. Uh, it's done really well in HADR environment. We've used it there already. Ambassador Edelman, when he was the Singapore ambassador, our U.S. ambassador to Singapore, had his web page devoted to part of the LCS when it was coming there on a rotational basis. Uh, and ambassador Wager, who took his place, he and I met for an hour in his office talking about how he wanted the LCS there, what he wanted the LCS to do. It's been embraced by the Southeast Asian navies. This is a huge step forward for us. It's not intimidating, you know, like the cruisers and the carriers and what have you. So the LCS has proved itself there, plus we can use it in a lot of different places. Uh, the joint high-speed vessel was mentioned yesterday, I think, a lot of ways. We're going to use that as a proof of concept for our Pacific Partnership events. What we're going to try to do is take a company of uh, Army medics, basically, put them on the ship, bring it to uh, Oceania, and places like Kiribati or what have you, see how it operates in there and how we can work together. This is going to be a big deal as it complements what we're doing with the USNS Mercy. Uh, here you can see what's going on with the, uh, the ship, some of the things we've got. We've had to uh, make some adjustments as well, and there's some funding issues that we've got too. The MLP, uh, obviously it's supposed to be just a, a port in the water. That was the original thing. Well, now we've got to come up with ways of doing it. 
We're very lucky that our N3, uh, Captain uh, Norm Weekland, Storman is a guy that had to work on the OpNav staff, and he was trying to figure out innovative ways to use it, and we're going to try to do that as well. How can we make it more accessible? How can we use it at sea? Uh, can we use soft forces on it, uh, marine forces? What can we do to employ it? So we're looking at different ways of how this is going to work when it comes to the theater. That was within 15 minutes because I promised Tony I would not go over. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I think it's been a, a great opportunity. I'm glad to listen to everybody. Uh, we're really busy in, in the uh, Westpac arena. We make 135 port visits a year. Uh, we, um, 125 exercises a year, 135 exercises. 350 port visits a year. We have uh, major exercises we conduct. Uh, every day we got something happening. So from our perspective, uh, a lot of times we're ignored because it's pretty stable out there. Except that uh, when we look at Russia, China, DPRK, uh, the border between Pakistan and India, the border between India and China, you start looking at what's happening between Vietnam and, uh, and China. Uh, those are things that we look at on a daily basis. And it causes us some worry. And if you ask Admiral Harris, what's his biggest worry in the Pacific Theater? He'll tell you it's DPRK. We have no idea what's going to happen. As you all know, today is the anniversary of the Chonin sinking. Uh, it was 2010 when that occurred. If you ever get a chance, and I put this on a blog that uh, Jimmy uh, Fennell has, uh, to go see it at uh, Inchon, where they got the two sections up on stanchions, and they've got a great display there, and they got all the pictures of it. They lost 46 rock sailors, uh, and uh, the North Koreans did this, and that was an act of war. Remember, there's an armistice there, and I thought the restraint that the government had was remarkable, and uh, we're worried about everything that Kim Jong-un does, because no one knows what he's doing. He's so unpredictable. So I pass it on, uh, and uh, I want to thank Tony and uh, uh, Dr. Everett, and also uh, uh, Admiral Howe again for letting me be up here to talk about the Westpac Arena. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Murray from American University. I want to start by thank our, um, telling you how appreciative I am to be uh, invited to this, to this conference. This is my first time at the Naval War Conference, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to come at this, the issue of security cooperation, from a much, much less direct route <laughs> uh, um, uh, than my, both of my panelists. Uh, we heard from Mr. Wesley as, from a, the perspective of an actual planner. And uh, Nina Serafino is um, a national, nationally re recognized expert on the legal authorities behind the myriad of security assistance programs. Um, I'm coming at this from a different um, uh, route, which is a concern about the balance, the institutional balance between um, the military side of the US government and the civilian side of the US government that works abroad. Um, I'm coming at it from uh, the, the sentiment behind uh, Robert Gates, the former Secretary of Defense, when he talked about the, the issue of the military taking on, over time, uh, many more non-traditional roles. But it was taking on roles that had been the, per the sole purview of civilian agencies, and that maybe, over time, that can lead to sort of a creeping militarization of American foreign policy. Um, and in that spirit, uh, um, I've actually recently uh, uh, come out with a book, which I'm going to uh, advertise, uh, uh, co-edited with Gordon Adams, which looks at, the, the title is Mission Creep, the Militarization of U.S. Foreign Policy, question mark. And it is an exploration of the ways in which the military has become increasingly involved in different issue areas. Um, and it, has, it features contributions uh, from, with, uh, by Nina Serafino on security assistance and also uh, Derek Reverend on security cooperation. And, and, uh, but it, and it looks at different issue areas, um, intelligence, uh, development, um, uh, public diplomacy, and some of the implications of the increased military role in, in these areas, which is relevant to my conversation here because my contribution to that book is a study that I did with Ambassador Tony Quainton, uh, which is looking at the role of the military in traditional diplomacy. 
um, and, and the role of, uh, and uh, how the increased use of engagement activities by the combatant commanders, how that affects um, the, the, um, whether it's influencing foreign policy. And there's some reason to think that it might. Um, this is a, a response to a, a, a work that was done by Dana Priest, the mission, um, and uh, she talked, she, just to give you a, a sense that this might be a problem, she, she wrote in 2003, on Clinton's watch, the military slowly and without public scrutiny or debate came to surpass its civilian leaders and resources and influence around the world. Um, and there's a, a civil military historian who agrees with that, with that. He wrote in 2002, the regional commanders have come to assume such importance in their areas, particularly in the Pacific, the Middle East, and Central Asia, that they have effectively displaced American ambassadors in the State Department as the primary instruments of American foreign policy. So that's actually what I'm trying to figure out um, uh, uh, in my work with Tony Quainton, what the truth of this. Um, and what we did to do this was to interview two dozen ambassadors and get their view of whether, how they, whether they felt displaced uh, by the, the increasing engagement of, com, of, of uh, combatant commanders and military components uh, in, in their host countries. Uh, these were two mostly recently retired ambassadors. Uh, they'd had several posts. Um, and and um, we asked them about their relationship with the combatant commander, how often the combatant commander came to their post, uh, um, the relationship of the combatant commander with the political and military leaders in their host countries, and the uh, activities of the military that were going on in those countries. And we found that um, the, the um, ambassadors did not feel displaced, <laughs> um, that they actually had a very favorable view of the, of, the, of the combatant commanders, and one that was not that they didn't see them as competitive, but as cooperative and supportive. Uh, we also found that um, the combatant commanders did not visit the countries that much, um, uh, that given the span of the region um, and the number of countries that they had to deal with, they were actually not in the country that much. Because typically, it might be two or three times unless it was a very strategic country. Uh, so we found that the, that it, in term, it, that the, that the um, ambassadors didn't feel displaced as the primary interlocutor between the U.S. government and the host country, that that, that that has been exaggerated. They did sometimes have trouble down the line, down the chain of command. Um, and, uh, there were, they gave stories of having to stop ill-advised military activities, um, but they would get backed up by the combatant commander in those, in those situations. Um, they, there were stories of having of difficulties of dealing with a senior defense officer in the embassy, because the senior defense officer in the embassy might, um, uh, was an advisor to the ambassador, but also had a direct line of communication to the COCOM, and that could create challenges. Uh, but overall, the, the, the results that we found were that, the, um, uh, that the, uh, from the ambassador's perspective, the ambassador's authority in, in the country um, was intact, that the, the ambassador is the president's representative, and that that was, that was respected by the, the combatant commanders, and that there was not this, this, comp, you know, this encroachment upon the, the area of traditional diplomacy. Uh, we did, just as an aside, um, we did not find the same favorable view from the ambassadors towards SOCOM. Um, there was a sense that, that uh, SOF uh, was more free wielding. Perhaps it's the devious <laughs> thinking that Captain Tiska talked about earlier, um, uh, and that they were less deferential to ambassador authority, and that there was some ambiguity about whether they, they would know about operations that were happening. Uh, in their host country. So there was some tension there. But in terms of the geographic combatant commanders, um, we did not find that. So then the question is whether or not um, the influence of the military on diplomacy is more subtle than that. You know, whether it comes from the sheer activity of, um, of, the, of the regional commands and they're sort of you know, setting a, more of a security agenda from the outside. Uh, and there's some indication that that may be true. Um, 
we asked ambassadors about their management of uh, security cooperation activities that were going on in the countries, and we found different patterns. You know, some, in some cases, ambassadors would have a very collaborative relationship with the combatant commander for common goals that they saw as strategic. You know, so Ambassador Barbara Bodine tells stories of, of um, her relationship with Tony Zinni and their, their mutual project of starting, you know, the beginnings of uh, laying the groundwork for a Coast Guard in Yemen. You know, that kind of an example. But we did find other examples. Uh, the, the ambassador from Jordan talked about how um, he learned of the plans for a special operations training center, a very prominent one, um, and that the plans were well along the way. There was a lot of momentum, and that he was very wary about the project at first because he, for political reasons, he didn't know whether the Jordanian people would be as favorably disposed toward the mill-to-mill -mill relationship as the leadership was, but that even though wary, there was, they had a momentum that was difficult to stop. So that's sort of an agenda setting by the military, an effect on political relations that comes from outside. Um, so there are examples of that. Uh, overall, though, um, you know, in terms of the attitudes of ambassadors toward security cooperation and resources by the military was appreciation. You know, there was a sense of um, uh, that, as one interviewee said, state can't make the case in Congress for resources. So we will do what we can with the military resources. Um, and they were appreciative of what the military could bring to um, uh, the country. Uh, so just to tie this together, just to sum up, um, I think that it's the idea that the ambassadors have been um, uh, overshadowed by the combatant commanders in country is exaggerated. Um, the ambassadors still have formal authority as the president's representative. Um, at the same time, there may be an indirect influence by uh, security cooperation uh, activities uh, by the sheer resources and the uh, regional perspective of the, of the combatant command, the planning culture, the energy, the sheer number of, of activities um, that, that sometimes come, that come from outside the country um, and, can, and can influence the foreign relations into a more of a security direction. Um, but the, then the question I have, and it's a question I don't have the answer to, and I'd I would be interested in the discussion, uh, insights about this, is then what is the coordination at the regional level? Um, uh, the, the relationship between the combatant commands have a regional perspective, they have regional planning, where, it, where the state, and they are in field, whereas in the State Department, that is in the Assistant Secretary, regional bureaus, and what is the connection, and maybe Mr. Wesley can um, give me some information on it's the connection between those two, um, and how much that is guided by the civilian side or, or, or the military side filling more of a void. Um, thank you. <laughs>